Any self-respecting town in the United States will have at least one car club celebrating anything from American classics, hot rods or a particular make of car and Canyon City, Colorado is no exception. Now despite the fact that it is just about freezing today, all these people have turned out especially for bonnets and hoods and uh, Jeannie Fuller is responsible for this gathering today. Jeannie, first of all, thanks for getting everybody out here. You're welcome. It's quite a sight, isn't it? Yes, it is. Tell me a bit about the Canyon Car Club. What sort of cars do you have and who's involved? Um, well, they're just a lot of families, a lot of different cars, um, street rods, street machines, classics antiques, just whatever they have, where they're just welcome to come and we just have a big time with them. And uh, you know. what's, the, what's the appeal though? Because these, is it just about nostalgia, trying to sort of look back to the past? Because well, I think it is. And, then, and a lot of people just really enjoy looking at the cars. Every place you go, people will uh, stop and, and talk to you about it and want to know how they are. and. And it's really fun to travel with them and go to different shows in the area. And are they all, do they all contain the old technology? Because these things were pretty hard to drive, uncomfortable, in terms of uh, today's technology. No, most of these cars you're going to see here are not original underneath. They may look original on the outside, but underneath they're not. They're all got high-powered, souped-up motors in them, so they can be driven out on the, on the highway. Now, we did say that uh, these people have all gathered here today because of us uh, coming over from Bonnets and Hoods, but you've got a different theory as to why they're here today. Yes, I do. They're here for the free food. <laughs> Let's be fair about this. <laughs> we, are, we have offered them some chili and hot dogs, and that's why they're here. <laughs> so it's a big social thing as well, yes, isn't it, it is. behind the vehicles? Yes. yes, people like to get together this way and, and compare vehicles, talk about vehicles, and... Uh, you learn something from everybody, you know, to something they've done on their car, you might want to try on your car. Well, it's, uh, I bought the body new, I bought the chassis new, it's all new components, so it has air conditioning and cruise and uh, all the benefits of a new car, really. Well, that's interesting because it's, you're, you're harking back to the nostalgic days with this car, but in right. fact it's, it's perfectly modern. Well, there's only so many of these cars made. We decided we wanted this body style, and there's none of them left, so the only way to have one this body style is buy one that's made and put the car together the way you want it to. Is that because you don't like the modern design of cars? Uh, partially. Partially it goes back to when we were kids, you know. We had hot rods when we were kids, and I've had them all my life, and now I'm about ready to retire, and I, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I'm not sure where we start with this, Vern. It's absolutely incredible. Thank Tell you. me a bit about it. What is it? It's a 1923 Ford T-Bucket Roadster. It's uh, running a three, 350 Chevy motor, 350 turbo tranny. Is anything uh, original on it? Uh, steering wheel. The steering wheel. Steering is wheel. The one thing that's, that's left. That's the only thing that's original on the car. And the pipes are fantastic. I mean, Thank this you. has all been designed. How do people design these things into their well, cars? You just you can buy different types. These are called sprint headers. You can buy all different types of headers for the T-buckets, but the sprint headers stick out. You can buy short headers if it had fenders on it. You know, you could run different different types of headers for different styles of cars. And I love the thing at the back here. You've got, a, you've got what looks like a miniature horse trailer uh, actually, in the back. Actually, it is a miniature horse trailer. I'm missing Box. something here. You couldn't get a horse in there, could you? No, you can Actually, you can't haul a horse in it, but it's, it's actually... It's called a miniature horse trader for some, for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, that's fake air vents car. Like I said, it's a fair weather car, but I did bring it out for this today. I can safely say, Vern, that that is unique Thank and you. only in America. Ron, this could never have looked like this in its early days, did it? No. Uh, it was a basket case car when I bought the car. What's a basket case car? It was, everything was piled inside the body. Huh. And it was just a body and frame, and it took me about two and a half years to put the car together. And uh, it's a 38 Ford Cabriolet. Uh, this has a solid top on it, but the top does lift off so that I can drive it around with, in the summertime with the top off. Is this the original shape at the front and things? Y yes, Absolutely it is. Absolutely as it was. Uh, we removed a uh, number of chrome pieces. There, were a lot of, there was a lot of chrome trim and stainless steel trim on the front. That's all been taken off. But the uh, basic shape of the car is original. 
and about how much of it is original in terms of the body parts? Um, about 75% of the body parts. Yeah. What it's, do you do for parts and backup and that sort of thing? The aftermarket is just brimming with parts. Uh, there are so many aftermarket parts available that you can build a car, you can open a magazine and you could build a car just from aftermarket parts. Really? And they're not original parts, those are parts those being are made? Reproductions, though. yes. Wow. So it's a healthy hobby then? Yep, it is. It, it's a very healthy hobby and uh, there's a lot of people that are making good money uh, building these types of cars for other people. Mm -hmm. uh, well this is a Ford Mustang, it's a 1965 and it looks nothing at all like my 99 Ford Mustang. It's been beautifully preserved and decorated, not so much painted as tattooed I think by Ben and Susan. It's got a 351 in it, Windsor and it's four speed and it's basically a show car. Well some of the modifications are the, the flares right here, put flares on it. Uh -huh. and the uh -huh. interior's got you know it's embroidered in roses. Yes. Very nice. And in the back you've um, you've either won a lot of prizes or you've you've been stealing things from someone. Yeah, it's a trophy winner. It's got a few trophies for it. <laughs> it is. This is quite serious. Yeah. And is this part of the scene as well? Is this a big part of the scene? Of yeah. Going in for competitions and winning things? Right. Yeah. You're, you're actually not part of the Canyon Car Club so much as your own club, which is the Saturday Night Cruisers. Tell me a bit about that, Susan. Um, what it was was these guys started out in the garage and they decided to take it somewhere else so they started the club in 99 uh -huh. uh -huh. we dress in the 50s clothes right. and take pictures black and white pictures with the cars like the racing we go to PMI we do races uh -huh. and we do parades and why do you think there are so many car nuts in Canyon City uh, nothing else to do <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the amazing technology and the innovations that are here at the Detroit Motor Show. I'm here with Casey Pruitt from TechMath, Tech Math. a company based in Michigan. Yes. And you have a contract with Ford, I understand, putting some incredible technology into the cars that actually lets me customize a vehicle to my body, to my shape, to my size. Is that right? That's precisely right. What we have is a laser scanning device. And this is a device that's used to measure your body very precisely, very quickly, and non-invasively. All right. And what we're doing with that data is able to extract the dimensions from that. Right. And then we can customize a vehicle to fit you most appropriately from a safety and an ergonomics perspective. Okay, so you need to get the shape of myself. What, do you frisk me or something? You go along like they used to do in the old cop shows? No, it's much easier than that. Okay. Actually, all you need to do is just stand inside of our booth scanner, and within 15 seconds, we have a planar laser system that travels over your body, and cameras measure that in space. Amazing. Did you say in your booth? That's right. Okay. We have a cabin booth that actually is a small enclosed space so that we can control the lighting so the cameras can see the laser a little bit better. Okay, last year, measure. or maybe a couple of years ago, I went to a Star Trek convention, and they never had a booth with a laser in it. This is incredible. We've got to see this. Okay. You're going to scan my body. Now, what is the laser doing exactly? It's reading the, 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 uh, the points of my body in space and, and, and recording them, is that right? That's right. It's not an intense laser, not from a medical perspective. It's really the same equivalent laser type that you would have at a grocery store reading barcodes okay. on products. The, the laser is traveling, it's a planar laser system that travels in a vertical feed system. Right. And the cameras are above and below each of those laser sources. Okay. And they record the position of that laser in three-dimensional space as it travels over your body. Oh. Okay, Adrian, so come on in here. Can't wait. Now X marks the spot, obviously. Yeah, Adrian, you need to stand on the X there. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. you're going to face this way. Okay. Just for the orientation. You get a profile shot of me now. And what's going to happen, Adrian, is that the lasers are going to start from the top and then they're going to travel down. You're uh -huh. going to see a, a red light as it goes over your body. Okay. And when the, it takes about 15 seconds. Right. When the light is at the bottom, it will be finished, and then the card will come out in this slot, and it will have your information written to the card. The card's going to come out of that slot. The card is going to come out of the Amazing. slot with your information written okay. onto it. It's all here, let's see what I'm like. 
Now, Casey, I have a card. What does this mean now? All of the data is stored in here? All this data that we just took from you on the scan and the questions you answered are on that card. And then, as you see here, this is a three-dimensional representation of you as you were standing Amazing. in the scanning booth. So in here, we see that I uh, am fashionably attired, but I, I, a little extra weight back there. What's that going to mean in terms of fitting me for a car? Well, um, what we would use then is we'd be able to go in and take your body dimensions from this scan right. and be able to understand exactly how tall you are from your waist up, how long your legs are, right. how wide your waist circumference is, mm -hmm. um, how long your arms are. These type of things we can then use to program a vehicle to adjust to fit you. So we know how, where to position the seat, where to bring the pedals to, where to move to. Also, they fit you optimally. Now, how is this going to be done? Is it going to be done? A lot of people have talked about custom buying cars on the internet for a few years now. Where's the booth? In my home? Is it at a dealership? Is it online? Where is that booth that we just had the uh, laser scan be? The idea of Ford is thinking about right now is that you would have a scanner inside of a Ford dealership. Mm -hmm. And then at the time you purchased a Ford vehicle, you would be able to get scanned as well as any of your family members that would be driving the vehicle okay. also. And then that information would be programmed into a key fob. You would then, every time you opened that door opened the, or started the car with that key, right. all of the elements in that car would adjust to fit you. And it would not necessarily just be the seat and the steering wheel, for example, but it could also be your favorite radio station presets, your Amazing. temperature control setting, the mirror position, etc. Really? That's something else. Casey, what happens though if I'm a 30-year-old woman, I'm starting a family, and I'm six or seven months pregnant? She's out like this, and you've already scanned her when she wasn't. Well, certainly uh, a similar situation would be after you've had a big Christmas feast, for example. Exactly. But what you can do is you can be scanned again at any time, and that new data can be programmed into your key fob for any change in life situation that you have. Um, so far, the response has been very positive. Really? People are really excited about being a part of technology, doing high-tech things. Mm -hmm. um, they like their cars. They like to customize their cars. Right. And so consumers are really... Uh, reacting positively so far. Casey, it's amazing. You can customize a car now, not just for the paint you want on the interior, but you can actually do it ergonomically, the settings on the dash. I, I had a great time doing it. My Thank pleasure, you so much. Adrian. Thank you. Casey Pruitt from TechMath. I had no idea I had such a, 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 a bad posture, but we'll see what we can do with that. That's it for here at the Detroit Motor Show. The technology is just expanding at an incredible rate. This is the classic car collection of Jim Thornbury, who has many excellent examples, many of which Jim has restored himself. This week, the 50s styling of the Buick Company. Well, the 49 car, of course, has got Dynaflow power on the gearbox. And uh, as you can see, it's got a very, very beautiful design for a car in the, of that year. Well, it's extraordinary. It's 1949. It looks, you know, it's doing extremely well. It's a beautiful running car. It's a straight eight engine, of course. What does the Dynaflow system do? What is that? Well, instead of having a direct drive on the gearbox, you have a fluid drive. And the fluid, of course, is picked up in scoops on, on, on two different uh, clutch plates. Now, an another interesting feature this car has are venti ports. There's a, there's a rather delicate story behind those, aren't there? There is indeed, yes. There was a gauze which was fitted at a later date. After, right. after, of course, these had been out and about for uh -huh. a year or so. And the, the manufacturers thought it would be better to have the gauze fitted inside of those ports. Right. Well, we'll leave it to people watching to do a bit of research on their own, actually, to find out what, what happened to the venti ports. But let me just say that they are part of a rather... Uh, the story is of a rather bizarre sexual nature. It we'll is just, indeed, we'll yeah. just leave it at that, yeah, I think. I, well, yes, only I often look round at shows to see that nobody is too close to them. <laughs> because I dearly like these cars. Especially and, and the I'm, men. And we're not looking for any younger cars. <laughs> you see, that's quite an interesting feature. The accelerator start, the turns the engine over, doesn't it? Oh, yes, yes. That could be yeah. something they could bring back, I think, after all these years. Yes, it certainly has worked. We've got that on a few of the cars. We've got it on the other Buick as well, which is the Skylark, uh, which again is another very rare car. What a beautifully styled convertible. And next week we're going to look at another Buick in Jim's unique private collection, the back end of which you'll either love or hate, the Buick Skylark.
you were to throw the word T-bird into a search engine on the internet, you'd come up with an extraordinary array of clubs, organisations and chapters, all dedicated to the love of the Ford Thunderbird. You'll also probably find the Thunderbird Centre, which is based here in Michigan, and the owner is Bill Gill. How are you today? Bill, nice to see you. Now, you might think this is the Thunderbird Centre, but no. This is just Bill's garage, a multicoloured neon shrine to the car itself. Bill, what is the magical allure of the Ford Thunderbird? It's the beauty, the styling, it's nostalgia, history, modern old car. Just a lovely car. Uh, just a pleasure to drive and a pleasure to observe. Just something extremely enjoyable which your wife and I have both enjoyed since 64. And they don't come better than this example here. This is a 1957. Tell me a bit about this particular car. This is a body off Concours restored car. Did five years ago. We added a wire wheel to it, which were a production for 62 Thunderbird, but just add some snap to it. If you change the wheels back, it would be very, very, very original, right to the color. It's uh, just a lovely car, and it was a Las Vegas, Nevada car. Well, it's clear that, uh, you know, this is a professional job. I have never, ever seen any car as clean as this. It's incredibly clean. Well, it's, it's been driven uh, for five years, but maintained well. And that's the magic is put it in a hoist, raise it up, clean the bottom of it, and, and spiff it all up. You must get the toothbrush out and everything there. In well, those we use a cloth and and uh, tongue depressors and different things of that nature. Now you are in many ways Mr. Thunderbird. You, you're, you're in charge of the Thunderbird Center which caters to every need for Thunderbird enthusiasts. Yes, we... Over the years, how many Thunderbirds have you had? In excess of 800. 800? Yes, 24 of those most I've had at one time in my hands. And uh, just a T-word lover and a T-word person and you love all these cars but just don't fall in love with them. Right. Then you can divorce them. Uh, yeah, because you have to get rid of them sooner or right. later. Right, so it's just a, just a love and a pleasure the wife and I both have. Okay. Well, show me around the car, would you? Uh, what have we got up here powering it? In? Well, we have a 312 uh, cubic inch motor, 245 horsepower, single four barrel car, and which matches the data plate, of course. And everything is very, very concourse correct, otherwise original as Ford did it. Uh, over restored. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. When were they first introduced the Thunderbirds? This is a 57. Well, September 9th, 1954 was the introduction of the uh, 55 Thunderbird. Now, of course, a lot of famous people have owned these cars, haven't they? Oh, certainly. The Sinatra family, Frank and his daughter both, of course, and uh, Betty Hutton which is a, was a singer, and you could just go forever and ever, and uh, uh, just hundreds and hundreds. 50% mm -hmm. uh, of all Thunderbirds built in 55, 6, and 7, were shipped to California, movie stars, money. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. Now there's probably 15% left out there because most of them are back east. And um, when it comes to your Thunderbird Center, are you finding that Hollywood movie stars are coming to you now to, to find parts? To We have a, uh, most people like that don't come directly to me. They all hire an outsource, another company or mediator to buy the parts, of course. And uh, we do meet a lot of interesting people. William Clay Ford, I bought his Thunderbird years ago. And uh, Mr. Jack Nasser was here several years ago. And I have a couple other T-Birds, a pink one and a gray 56. And he was possibly interested in buying one for his wife. And so it was a very interesting conversation, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Jim Holnick, CEO of Chrysler Corporation, a T-Bird owner, and just a lot of uh, Oh, very well known people and a lot of Ford executives of course own T-Birds if not two or three but it's the love of the car it's the pleasure the beauty of looking at it just to have it in your garage and to walk out in the morning and say wow you see a lot of American classic cars are beautiful you know they they speak a lot about a, p a portion of American history but for you why is it the T-Bird and not one of the many other beautiful classic cars I think it's the influence I got when I was in my early teens of unfortunately the rich man in town always had the Thunderbird and uh, very much excited me. I thought they were the most beautiful thing in the world and still do. And so in 2002 a new Thunderbird coming out. And I ordered my new Thunderbird four years ago for two different dealers so I have two of them on order. Will I be the first one to get it? Well I don't know this for sure but uh, so hopefully I'll end up with two new ones and that's I just think they're lovely. It's is it, beautiful. Is there a cachet then to, to get being the first to get one? 
Oh, I think that's everybody's little dream. There's no doubt about that. It's, that's, uh, being is going to be limited production the first year, of course, and you know, it'll be the personal block is always nice. <laughs> no doubt about that. Have they been true to the styling, Jay Mays? Has he, has he got the styling right? Has he, the echoes of the past in the new one correct, in your opinion? There's some taste of the new and the old together, and there's some changes on their new roadster they built with like 62 with the tunnel cover in the back. And yeah, there, it's, there's some taste there, and uh, we have to keep modern, we have to keep up with the emissions and airbags and safety and all this stuff, so there has to be change. There has to be safety change. But then again, it's a two-seater Thunderbird, therefore it's a very, very wanted item. Yeah, I'd say the new car is bringing a lot back for the old car and bringing the prices definitely absolutely up. So these are a good investment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, good investment only if you're wise and hire a guy that knows the car well to praise it for you. Okay. And tell you if you're making a good investment. <laughs> so, uh, go on then, Bill. How much are you going to sell this one to me for? Mm -hmm. Well, on. truthfully, if you brought this car to an auction right now, it'd probably bring uh, an honest 75 in Phoenix next week. 75,000? Yes, sir. Wow. Yes, sir. I believe it would. And again, you can buy somebody else's headache, which they may not know the value of it when they did it seven years ago, for example, and might be able to buy this car for $30,000 by shopping and having a good advisor. Mm. <laughs> That's the magic. Having a good appraiser, a good advisor, knows the product well. And this is something else we also do in a local area, or we occasionally fly to Dallas or wherever if they wish to pay the fare. Hmm. So it's a lot of fun. So you do spend a lot of time moving around advising people on what to buy? Yeah, I spend probably two months a year on the road of uh, buying parts, you know, rare parts, or looking at a special car for somebody or appraising cars. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. It's the pleasure of the business. It's actually make money at fun. And it's just be like playing baseball. And that's all for this week from our new series, Boots and Trunks. Fenders and bumpers. Uh, windshields and windscreens. Gas and petrol. Bonnets and hoods. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>